you done now. Hi, everybody. This is Bob Gale, co-creator of Back to the Future, and you're listening to Brad Gilmore. Doc! 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 Okay, relax, Doc. It's me. It's me. It's Martin. Doc, oh, it can't be. Just sent you back to the future. Yeah. Oh, I know. He did send me back to the future, but I'm back. I'm back from the future. Great. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Uh, are you telling me that you built a time machine? Kind of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it some style? Hello, everybody, and welcome to Back to the Future, the podcast, the only podcast looking back in time for the greatest film trilogy of all time, Back to the Future. I'm your friend in time, Brad Gilmore. Here we are, episode two of season nine of Back to the Future, the podcast. Got several in the tuck for you that I know you're going to enjoy. This is uh, part two of my interview with Steve Frank. Steve Frank's, of course, he is the creator of one of my favorite shows of all time, Psych. If you haven't listened to part one of our interview, uh, I suggest you go over there and check it out right now so you won't be completely lost here. But again, he um, is a creator of Psych. He wrote films such as Big Daddy. He um, uh, is very successful in the realm of Hollywood. He's a screenwriter, director, musician. Um, just overall, an incredible, uh, incredible entertainer. And um, you, you definitely have seen his work one place or another. And um, I just was so privileged to talk to him about films in the 1980s, of course, and um, about Back to the Future. So the first part of our conversation was getting to know Steve a little bit, hearing his background, hearing how Big Daddy got created, hearing how Psych got created, his love for 1980s. This man in his film school class was playing the airport hangar scene from Fletch. Come on, guys. It's all ball bearings these days. Right? It's all ball bearings these days. And um, I'm sure future fans also recognize uh, a certain character from that airport hangar scene in Back to the uh, in, in Fletch. Because in Back to the Future Part 3, that gentleman who was one of the airport flight, uh, I, I guess, well, who was he? He was Stan Wicks. Uh, was he Stan Wicks, like, personal pilot, or was he an engineer? Uh, I don't remember, actually. But it doesn't matter. You might recognize him because uh, it was Burton Gilliam, who was the Colt gun salesman in Back to the Future Part 3. He was also Alan Stan Wicks, uh, flight engineer, private plane engineer in, in Fletch. So, it's interesting that Steve Franks chose that scene from Fletch because, of course, uh, we saw Burton Gilliam later on in uh, in Back to the Future Part 3. And one of the main characters of Sykes' name is Burton Guster. Look at all the connections I just made. Like, seriously? Seriously. God, man, that was awesome. Uh, so we're going to talk to Steve Franks Part 2 of our interview. If you haven't checked out Part 1, please go and do so. And also, guys, I... Um, Mentioned last week on the show that we have a new podcast home. And part of this podcast, you might hear ads here every now and again. But a lot of the success of this show is going to be based on you leaving reviews on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Pre pre you know, predominantly? Primarily. That's the word I was looking for. Primarily on Apple Podcasts. So if you haven't already, go over there give a five-star review. I go and I read them. So on an upcoming episode of Back to the Future, the podcast, I'll read out some of those reviews, give you shout-outs. And I'm going to send a book, autographed copy of Back to the Back from the Future, a Celebration of the Greatest Time Travel Story Ever Told, which is the book that I put out in 2020. Paperback came out in 2021. There's an audio book out. There's e-books. There's so many ways to get it. If you haven't gotten that book already, please go and do so. You can get it at backtothefuturebook.com, at uh, oh theboatbradgilmore.com, or um, Amazon, Target, Walmart, wherever books are sold, uh, mango.biz or Mango.bz is the home of, of that book as well. And you can get my other book, Bond, James Bond, Exploring the Shaken and Stirred History of Ian Fleming's 007. Uh, that is also available in all the same places I just listed. So, without further ado, I say we get to Mr. Steve Frank's part two of our conversation, and this is where we dive into Back to the Future. 
We talk a little bit about his connections to the film, his favorite of the trilogy, his favorite side characters. There's a lot of future talk here, a lot of future talk. So, uh, and even that Christopher Lloyd. So go check this out. This is part two of my interview with Steve Franks on Back to the Future, the podcast. Really great actress, really great actress yeah. and great director. You're right. Um, so, okay, back to the future. Let's talk about kind of the films themselves. So you're an 80s guy. Talk to me. I mean, where did Back to the Future rank for you? When it came out, was it your everything and more? Did you just absolutely adore it? It's, you know, and, and when people ask me what my favorite film of all time is, I, first of all, I say we have to go genre. <laughs> because it's too hard but you know everybody's got a cool like ah taxi driver citizen kane bridge over the river kwai and to me it's it's raiders of the lost ark and back to the future and uh yeah. uh you know uh, maybe i'm not the coolest guy but those movies are the, the what everything what a movie theater is about experiencing and i i remember i remember not only when and where i i had to my, my superpower for a while was uh, was I could remember the theater. I saw every movie I'd ever seen it. Um, and then once I had kids, somehow that got sucked out of my brain. So I'd lost some of that, but not all of it. Um, but I not only remember that, I remember where I was like the afternoon reading the review in the LA Times, like I'm going to this movie tonight. <laughs> and... And I was just so excited about it because, you know, I love the, obviously you and I are both huge fans of the, of the time tra travel mm -hmm. genre, but I loved the tone that they, that they, they cut there because it's fun and funny. And, you know, it's, it's the, it's the thing that makes Raiders of the Lost Ark work so much. That movie is really funny. Yeah. And, uh, and that's what makes a lot of these Marvel movies work. And when Marvel movies don't work, it's, Often you can look to, hey, you know what? They might have taken it a little too seriously. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so for me, it's like I, uh, you know, I think the first one to me is like a quintessential uh, moment. It's obviously um, uh, like most people, it's my favorite of the trilogy. Uh, but for me, like the most impactful of the three movies is number two, uh, because that was the moment when I saw number two. Uh, it was, that's when I knew I wanted to be in the film and I, I was going to do this. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah. And I was, I was at, uh, I was in college getting an English degree and I was making films occasionally on the side, you know, it was like, they had a video program. It was an elective and, uh, and that movie, especially the second half, like everybody loves like the, 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 the 2015 part of that. I love the second half of that movie when they go back to 1955 and they're watching themselves. To me, that is like a, a level 10 in complexity and cool storytelling and stuff that I just never seen before at that time. And uh, that was the moment I said, I'm doing a time travel. And uh, to this point, haven't gotten one off the <laughs> ground, but my buddy and I, who went to school with me, we were we were making movies all the time. We ended up making a one hour black and white noir time travel thriller uh, that on our own, because at that point in school, you know, we, we were the only ones using the TV studio besides just their little projects. So they basically gave us a key to the studio <laughs> and we'd we'd sit there. We'd, we had, we were shooting it all on uh, on high eight and which which was a video format uh, back then. And uh, and we would dupe it down to three quarter inch uh, and we'd, we'd be editing. But uh, but it was it was all because that the, the, the amazing complexity of that movie and how much fun it was to play with the genre. Well, I mean, I've always said the sequel Back to the Future Part Two specifically. Such a brilliant idea, because what do people want from a sequel? They want the first movie, yeah. but they want it kind of different, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's what they did. They said, okay, we'll actually go into the first movie and show you different angles and change some things. So everyone was satisfied. I think part two is, like, like you said, from a tight rope act. I mean, the fine line that they had to walk to make yeah. all that make sense. You're in three different time periods. You have an alternate uh, 1985, and then you can't run into your future self. There's so many uh, plot devices that, that bring tension into the movie. I can remember watching it as a kid, and when Doc Brown asks 85 Doc Brown to hand him the wrench, and, and he uh -huh. corrects him, and he can't look at him. And, you know, I mean, the tension just there for me was so great from a storytelling perspective. But do you have this one-hour 
thriller still? Do you do you have possession of this Steve well, Frank's yeah, we, original? We made it, you know, but uh, you know, it was what is it, 1990, 89? I guess we made it 90 because it would have been, you know, production time. Yeah, November 89 is when Back to the Future 2 came yeah, out. So, so yeah, so we we compl- we began principal photography. <laughs> yeah. Late 89. What was so great about what of being uh you know having a, this sort of TV studio is like you'd have, you'd come up with an idea on Tuesday and then you'd be shooting on Friday, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the great thing is my buddy and my, my buddy was a really amazing cameraman. So he was great with it, with, with the lights and the imagery. And then I was always in the movies, not because I was a particularly good actor, but I would write them and I would know that I would always be there <laughs> because <laughs> I knew I was going to show up no matter what. So that was, uh, that was my uh, big thing. So, so yeah, I have that. I have that idea too. I have since then. I have. I have a time travel idea that I wanted to do on the heels of Sight. We ended in 2014, right? Um, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm. I've got this time travel idea. Well, the problem was 2015 was coming out, and I thought, well, this is perfect because you know next year is going to be the year that, that they went to the future and back to the future. Everybody else had that. So by the time yeah. we wrapped the last season of Sight. Nobody wanted time travel shows. Like I didn't even pitch it anywhere, <laughs> and they'd you know they'd sold Timeless and whatever all the other ones that uh, that went and, and uh, so. But I am it's it's I have it right here. I have um, I keep what I call my slate, and uh, it's now third. It's third on the list. I just keep clicking it up uh, to to what comes next, and then uh, until I do something else, I it becomes the next thing on the uh, on the list. But it's 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 my it's the one thing that I haven't got to do and that I, that I'd want to do the most because I really want to bring the fun back into time travel because once you start opening too many multiverses and nothing, nothing means anything anymore. And they did a really nice job with it in, in spider verse mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and Dr. Strange. Uh, but you know, I, I think you, you have to have a very specific clean line through it and, and keep it fun because that's it's wish fulfillment. Whether you want to change the past or change your future, it's it's the ultimate form of of wish fulfillment. And you know, getting the the sort of metaphor of getting to th- do things over again in your life is something that everybody can identify with. And and you're right, the multiverse stuff. You know, in the, the second Doctor Strange movie just came out. I enjoyed it, um, but you know, the multiverse thing. Yeah, you're right. It kind of loses a little bit of its luster when it's like, oh, here's the seventh Doctor Strange of the movie, and what what time frame are we in now and where is this happening and and um i actually thought that you know they, there's some things that you know what well, this isn't a marvel podcast but there's some things about that movie i wish they would have done differently like the first time we see professor x in an mcu film and he you know i mean it was cool but i thought there was just more that could have been could have been done with it but that's you know neither here nor there it's not this yeah isn't- it's it's playing with fire too and especially to take a character that big and to, no spoiler um right. here to do what they did uh yeah. with it it's uh, there's going to be a lot of people and i'm not necessarily an x-men person i'm i'm more the the, the straight ahead disney whatever the, the straight ahead marvel yeah uh universe and i'm happy to see the the x-men work into it but maybe they work on their own maybe they work uh, outside their own little universe uh you know, I, I wouldn't mind seeing Deadpool in a Disney movie. I don't know how they do that, but just to see how they would pull it off. But <laughs> you know, you bring up Deadpool. Ryan Reynolds, I think, is perfect for the role. There, no one else could play it. Fletch, perfect for the role. Uh, Chevy, yeah. I don't think anyone else could play it. I know they have the new Fletch coming out. I think this year, confess Fletch. Uh, we'll see how that goes. I think it's completely different uh, in tone. Uh, but you know, Marty McFly, Michael J. Fox. It was just a perfect casting, and obviously it was going to be Eric Stoltz at first. But yeah, can you? I mean, can you have thought of anybody else from that time that would have made sense? No, no. It, right. It's it's and the fact that they were six weeks in and pulled the plug, you know. And Eric Stoltz is a, a really good actor, but you can't imagine getting that kind of energy. And there's just if if you what you know the the intro to your show that you you play a couple audio clips mm-hmm. and there's just there's inflections that michael j fox makes that both he and christopher lloyd are doing and there's just this great like complete crazy it's like it's almost like wrestling energy to it you know and they're uh they they really they they bring it to a, a level 
of, of life and energy that, that it required because it's, of course, it's ridiculous, but you buy uh, because they're up here, you buy it all, you know, and, uh, and it's, it's hard to imagine, you know, without Gary David Goldberg saying, all right, well, you know, go sleep in the back of a, uh, in the back of a station wagon and, and learn the lines. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy. And then if you ever, I don't know if you ever watched, I'm sure you have, that's, this is the most ridiculous. Of course you've watched the animated show. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, of course. But whoever that poor dude, they got to try to do Marty McFly was, it's like, yeah, no, you can't. It's, he's trying, but it, it doesn't, it does, doesn't work on any level. And then the weird thing too, is Dan Castellaneta as Doc Brown. He did Doc Brown. Yeah. Isn't that so weird? It's so strange because Dan Castellaneta couldn't have been that cheap. So I know they could have paid for Christopher Lloyd. Well, so, and the thing about the animated series is they had Christopher Lloyd in the opens and the closes yeah. of every show. So I, I don't know why you don't carry that over throughout the, the character. But the, the other crazy thing about the animated show is that was the introduction to a national audience of Bill Nye, the science guy. Weird he fact, like, right? It's like the other guy there, and he's kind of like silent, and he would help them do a, a, an experiment. So, so, so many layers, so much that, that Back to the Future is brought to the world. Oh yeah, a ton. Um, now you say two, you thought was very cool in, in the complexity of it. Obviously, one's a perfect movie. What are your thoughts on Back to the Future three? Because when I talked to Chris Lloyd, that's his favorite. Oh, of course, because it's his. It's Doc it's Brown's his story. story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Mary Steenburgen, who's so fantastic in it, I love that movie. I think it's it's a it's a perfect reset uh, to uh, to everybody who thought, ah, oh, this is too much. I can't understand what's going on because <laughs> I remember the rub was with Back to the Future. Is like uh, the second one was like, what is going on? We can't understand all this. So it was a great, clean movie. It's a really good movie, but to me, it's 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 a distant third. Um, but it's a sweet and, and really, really nice, but there's a few problematic things in there, but, uh, but to, to me, it's like the only thing I wish they wouldn't have done with the sequels and they had to do something, mm -hmm. but, but hinging the entire thing on somebody calling Marty McFly chicken. Right. It's, it's like, Oh God, please just anything. He's going to throw away everything because someone says, what are you chicken? So that's uh, that that through line. I wish I wish they'd gotten something else. I guess that may have been like a commentary on like the toxic masculinity of the 80s. Like you couldn't look inferior ever, um, especially coming from that. I mean, coming from the 80s, you, you, again, you have Fletch, you have Beverly, you have uh, Axel Foley, you have Indiana uh, yeah. Jones, you have Rocky, you know, in the early parts and stuff. I guess it was hard for the, the dominant male figure to show any uh, infallibility or any vulnerability uh, uh, and so maybe that was where the idea came from. Uh, you're right because in the first one, though, his his through line is really he's by proxy he gets over his fear of rejection by seeing George get over his fear. And there's yeah, a, you know deleted exactly. scene where he sends in or or from the script where he sends in his demo to the record company, right? And you actually yeah, see yeah, the package and, and at the end of the stuff. movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and all of that in the first one, and you know, and the rub always has been, well, they don't say anything about the chicken thing in the first movie. I don't care about that. I think the chicken thing is not. It's let's throw that out. Let's go. Let's go with something else, <laughs> or <laughs> let's figure out a way that maybe whenever someone instead of just saying what are you chicken, maybe they come up with something and just a slightly more cutting that gets into that toxic masculinity thing. Yeah, but uh, but it's uh, you know they ha they had to do something so you don't you don't blame them they're painted in the corner they probably weren't planning on there being a second one they had such a hard time getting the first one going so they you know they they weren't ever they weren't ever gonna oh all right we're keep this open for the next one even though you know they end with the, well, I call it the Burt Reynolds ending where it's smoking the bandit and they go running off uh, you know they're riding off to the next uh, the next adventure and you you weren't supposed to know what it was. Uh, but, uh, but to me, it's like, that was, that was the one, the one downside to it still all three, as far as a trilogy, you know, they're how, who's ever going to stop at a trilogy anymore when they can make four, six, 12. Uh, so, you know, when, when we started making psych movies, instead of saying there's going to be a trilogy, I started at six just because <laughs> I didn't want to aim too low. You, know? you got to aim high. You got to aim high. And, and the thing too is. And, and, and you're, you're a film fan, you're a film buff, so you would actually be the person to ask this to. 
because I make the argument in my book and I've made it to several people who I've gotten into debates with. I think it's the greatest pure trilogy of all time, right? Because every other film franchise has either added to it, had prequels or things of that nature. The only other pure trilogy I can think of is The Godfather. And yeah. The Godfather 3 is a pretty considerable dip, right, from 1 yeah, to 2. Yeah, huge, a huge dip. Massive. It's, it's Yeah, I mean, it's hard to watch. I mean, you're George Hamilton as, as as the consigliere. I mean, that one. I mean, that's a pretty big. And no disrespect to to the, the legend, the tan legend yeah. himself. But I'm just saying, like, he's no Robert Duvall, right? Um, uh, so it's a by big the way, t- there there is a George Hamilton reference in an upcoming psych thing. So I'm very excited you bring up George Hamilton. Oh. Well, I mean, I'm sorry, a in development psych thing, or I'm sorry, I can't say that either. A possible future psych thing. How about okay, that? Okay, I like. That. Oh, I like that. You just made me really excited. Um, but so do you think it's the greatest pure trilogy of all time? Am I going out too far to say that? I don't think so, because of what what else is still a trilogy? You know, you could you could have argued for uh for the Indiana Jones trilogy until they made it, they made the fourth one. Now they're making the fifth one. So there's there's that, and then <laughs> Beverly Hills Cop, which two is a drop off from one, and then three, you know, despite it being directed by our good friend John Landis is is quite a drop off and in a theme park. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's the thing. Oh, by the way, I sold a theme park show. I've, that's my other thing: time travel and a theme park show. Because I want to do a show in a theme park and find no one's ever gotten it right. No one's even gotten close. So for me, it's like doing something in a theme park. It doesn't it? Doesn't it can be a romantic comedy? It can be a sitcom. It can be a um, action adventure. Uh, I want to do a movie in th- or a show in a theme park. That's yeah. uh, very exciting. But um, but yeah, that was uh, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> right. No. And and I think they are doing a fourth one anyway. Right. Aren't they doing they a fourth keep, cop? They keep flirting with the idea. Yeah. They like they had that like the CBS did a pilot and then they did a sh- they're going to do a show and then they said someone else was going to do the fourth. That's one of those when I see it either on my Netflix screen or uh, or in the movie theaters. That's when I'm going to believe that. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's the greatest pure trilogy of all time. And so um, I, I like that you back me up on that. Um, one thing that was great about Psych, uh, the multitude, but there's always so many fun side characters. I mean, whether whether he was even Woody, who's not like he's not like the principal cast. He might not see him in every episode. He's almost kind of like the Newman in a way uh, of the yeah. series somewhat. But there's always great side characters. I think the same about Back to the Future, whether it's Mayor Goldie Wilson uh, or, course, yeah. or or PR, the farmer Peabody, uh, things like that. Do you have a favorite side character in Back to the Future, even if it's someone who gives you a one-off line or anything like that? Um, yeah, I, there's there's so many of them. I like I like Strickland's son. I always, you know, that there's that there's that really dark um, deleted scene from yeah, three where he gets killed. <laughs> Yeah, huh? I'm like, ah, I kind of want to see that. You want to see that go forward. And of course you love, of course you love uh, Billy Zane in there. Anytime you could, uh, you could get him. Have you ever seen Billy Zane's audition to be Biff? Yes. Yeah. He's, he's, he's really like, he controlled. It's like, you know, you, you kind of, uh, you think, oh my God, Billy Zane. And he's got all, the full thing of hair at that point. Beautiful, and- beautiful head of hair. Yeah, oh my God, extraordinary. And you, and you think, oh, this guy's got it. But then Thomas Wilson's doing something that's just up here, you know? And it's like, oh, that's uh, that's how it all came together. Uh, so, you know, for me, it's like, I uh, um, I, I, I do like the, uh, I, I love, I love Biff's gang. Uh, I think, th- I think they're, they're a ton of fun. I like, uh, you know, obviously I like the two main guys. They're, uh, they're guys, the, the cowboys are fun in the uh um uh, in the third one especially when you're getting when you're getting like these classic actors who are like i think i know who that is i have to consult with my dad to uh <laughs> who these are but i mean i mean the, i think the brightest light of any guest star in 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 the in the movies is mary steenburgen because she's she just gives a whole new energy to the whole thing and you you know you feel you feel the sort of the conflict that Doc Brown, who's never going to interfere in the past, feels with, you know, meeting this really sort of wonderful, wonderful soulmate uh, for himself. So she's I, I, she's the, the key one for me. But, uh, you know, it's it's pretty, pretty solid group of uh, such of solid casting. Guys. Like, yeah, just exactly. From top to bottom. Uh, and you, you talk about Tom Wilson. Yeah. And you all had him on psych, as you said. I think I counted at one point there's seven to eight variations of the Biff character or Biff 
relative that he had to play in those three movies. You know, the, uh, the versatility of, of it. I mean, really, though, and the nuance of the different characters. I mean, that that's a lot for one actor to play in three films. <laughs> I wish they I wish they like had one of the iterations of Biff be like a total gentle soul and like a, a reluctant hero or someone who turns around. He's he's just pure evil like that. Yes. Their, their DNA is just bad. Yeah. And <laughs> no redeemable qualities. No, none yeah, at all. There's nothing. There's no moment that uh, the only time he's he's not being horrible is when he's being completely, you know, subservient to George McFly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's just so great. Um, I mean, I mean, again, we we could talk about the the films for, for so long. Um, now you talked about original title uh, of Big Daddy was uh you you said it was Man Gets Kid. Yeah. Uh, guy gets kid. Guy gets kid. Guy gets kid. Um, and again, you know the the story of the alternate title for Back to the Future: oh, yeah. Spaceman Space from Man Pluto. Pluto. Yeah, <laughs> so great, uh, so great uh, in there. Just imagine what the movie would have been if it was that. Again, and go for it. Oh, I just say when they when they talk about you know like having a producer on board, like a good producer. What does a good producer does? That's what a good producer does. He makes Sid Scheinberg like that feel like ah, I was joking. Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed to try to double down on this title that I did. And, uh, you know, thank God that this movie took the journey that it did because, you know, Spielberg, they didn't want to be hooked up with Spielberg at the beginning because they didn't want to look like, oh, we're the guys who write movies mm -hmm. that Steven Spielberg, <laughs> that aren't hits for Steven Spielberg. Right. So, so, you know, thank God it, it came back around to him because so many of the things that happen, if, if Steven Spielberg's not the producer, they don't change lead actors six weeks in. There's, there's no way that Robert Zemeckis, even though Romancing the Stone was extraordinary, even mm -hmm. though, you know, uh, it's his, his whole catalog of uh, movies, you know, used cars is such a funny, funny, well-made movie that, uh, that I was far too young to be seeing and i don't know why my parents let me see it we saw saw that in the drive drive in and then the other movie you made uh which you can never find is movie called i want to hold your hand right uh, which a also, beatlemania kind of movie yeah yeah wendy joe sperber mm. uh is is in it and uh i actually wrote a uh a college paper on on the role of nostalgia in robert zemeckis films oh really <laughs> And, and once this, again, once again, people are writing about real world things, <laughs> important things. And I'm talking about used cars and the, and the, I want to hold your hand and the romancing the stone and Roger <laughs> Rabbit, of course. Oh, Roger Rabbit, another I mean, home run slam dunk of a film. But what was the if you don't mind sharing? Like, so what was the overall thesis? Why? Why did he rely on nostalgia in your college opinion? Well, I, I think my my and I, I don't remember it, and it was probably not that well written. But uh, I think it was he, the way he utilized nostalgia to tell talk about our current world and uh, and the way that we work and and you know just the, how what was going on in back the and not in and Roger Rabbit is was sort of indicative of what was going on to at, at times in the nineties. So it was it was. One of those things where, um, you know, I just love those movies. I want an excuse to watch those movies over and over again, especially to talk about uh, to talk about Roger Rabbit, because that's uh, that's the technological um, skill that it took to, to pull that off is uh, is mind boggling, you know, especially at the time. Uh, and so for me, it was like, hey, this <laughs> I was trying to find a topic and I go, all right, all right but Roger Rabbit in the past. Okay. All right. Back to the future in the past. Romancing the stone. Crap. Okay. <laughs> How do I tie it in? Well, Romancing the stone's kind of like an old fashioned movie. All right. I'm back. All right. Now I got to loop in. I want to hold your hand. I got it. I got it. It's all about nostalgia. I kind of cleverly left out used cars because it doesn't, doesn't fall into any of those, uh, sure. those categories. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just like to celebrate, you know, someone who's consistently made groundbreaking movies that, that that give you the joy of a pure cinema, and yet has has brought something new technologically to every step, and done something, you know, done something that that you're saying you're always saying with the Zemeckis movie, how they do that. 
Yeah. You know, so it was, uh, you know, there's, there's people that in the business, you just like, you're so happy to see anything that they've done because uh, even if it doesn't work completely, you're just, uh, you want to, you see them in their, uh, uh, in their productions. Yeah. Oh, and, and he's somebody, I mean, even you go to back to the future part two, I mean, the having Michael J. Fox play with himself in the same scene and having to build the camera. And then there was an earthquake on set. They had to make sure everything was, you know, uh, not moved too much or screwed up all the production. He's always been an inventor. Um, and that's why it's always been great to, to watch his movies. Um, a, a few more things for you, Steve. I mean, I literally, I think we could talk all night, but I don't. We could. And I, and you know what? Here's the problem. I will talk all night. So you need to stop me. <laughs> so I have I have a few few more things for you. Um, speak, speaking of Back to the Future 2, how long did it take you to realize it was a different George McFly? Um, well, I, well, unfortunately it's a little inside baseball for me because I read about the problems they have with Crispin Glover and all mm -hmm. that stuff. I thought it was pretty genius idea to put him upside down Yes, since you can't, uh, since you can't tell, but, uh, I really, that's one, uh, once again, it was one of those things that I'm sure they could have worked it out. I, they'd gone back one more time and just say, all right, this is the deal, you know, and, uh, you know, it, it was unfortunate because he he gave so much to those movies. I mean, obviously, there's not a lot for the poor guy who had to replace him uh, mm -hmm. to do in the in the movie. But uh, whatever they would have done had they actually had Crispin Glover in there probably would have been um, another another notch higher for uh, what they'd done. But yeah, to me, it was like, even though he was upside down, I, I, but I already had the information, but I, I knew completely that it, it wasn't him. I think just for me growing up is, you know, watching him as a young kid, you don't realize it until you're much, I didn't even realize that they changed Elizabeth's shoe or Claudia <laughs> Wells went to Elizabeth's shoe forever for the longest time. I didn't, it didn't clock with me. Uh, <laughs> but by the way, Claudia Wells is my favorite Jennifer. So, uh, and I'm a huge Elizabeth Shue fan. I, I, I love her, but, uh, but Claudia Wells was the thing. And, you know, obviously she had, she, she's like, was her mom sick or something? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, so she, she went to do the right thing, but, uh, but she, you know, the, and once again, the, you know, the, the, the Bobs always say that if they knew they were going to do a sequel, they never would have put Jennifer in the car. And they just, they're so determined to, to put her in an alley or into a closet or something. And I, I, the one thing I wish they'd done, I wish they would have just embraced it and figured out a way for her to be right in the middle of the action. I mean, now you can kind of see how uh, the way they do. I'm, I'm sure they were terrified by the schedule, shooting two movies back to back for yeah. the first time. You know, all of that. It's like, hey, we need to be able to, to handle a schedule. Uh, but I wish they'd done a little bit more with her um, once they go to 2015. Yeah, because Elizabeth Shue doesn't really have a whole lot to do in any of those movies. Like, she faints a lot. She's just yeah. there. Yeah, she's fainting or she's sleeping in an alley or on a porch that doesn't belong to her. Like there's something <laughs> like that going on with her. We got Elizabeth Shue and we're going to have her pass out. And, uh, and not show her back. on screen for 30 or 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great idea. You know, great idea. Um, but I'm with you. Claudia Wells is just um, in, in two, like just to put it into superficial terms in 1985, I mean, she's breathtaking on screen. When you see her uh, cheering oh, yeah. Marty on, she's just like. 10 out of 10. Beautiful. Yeah. And she just, she feels, you know, she, you know, as much as Michael J. Fox feels like he's a high school senior, she, she, she fits with him, you know, right. in the, in the same way that, uh, uh, that you would, would, would have hoped. Uh, poor Melora Hardin, who um, was too tall. I know. I know. Can you <laughs> she, imagine? Probably, is that something that you've ever had to deal with? Sorry, Steve, you're just too damn tall to write this I'm script. I'm always too tall. I'm too tall. And now, here's the worst thing. Now they're building roller coasters where 6'4 is the cutoff. And I'm so mad. I'm going to go on a crusade. I, I, I've, I've never tweeted anything negative in my life, but I think I'm going after the, the roller coaster industry for making these, oh, you can't ride if you're 6'4 and over because it's just crazy. It's ridiculous. Well, if, there, if there's any discriminated against a group going on right now, it's definitely <laughs> six foot eight guys who can't ride roller coasters it's a big problem in this. or fit in cars or <laughs> ride on planes or right 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 leg, leg room is a thing of the past that was uh those were during the golden age of uh of endless profits oh yes <laughs> absolutely um you know when i got to uh speak for to james and Dule uh for psych 2 we did an interview for psych the, uh psych 2 last you come home 
Um, obviously, I, I brought up Back to the Future and the time travel story. James did say like it was on the board for a long time and it's something that you confirmed. Was there ever a germ of an idea of, OK, here's how we can do it? This oh, is yeah, no. what we're going to go we, into. It, at, at the end of each season, I had a board. I'm sure I to, I've told you this before. I had a board of all the ideas we're going to do. And they, sometimes they take, you know, musical was on there. It took till six, season six or seven, whenever we got to it. And, uh, you know, and uh, uh, Guy Ritchie was one of the ideas I wanted to do. It took me till season eight. And we had all these things. And they would just be one or two lines about what it would be and uh, what we do. But time travel was always one, two, or three on that list. And we would open it up and it's always like, okay, a guy comes back and a uh, dead guy and he's wearing clothes from the twenties. All right, now what do we do? And we can never come up with a satisfying enough resolution to it without them actually traveling through time. <laughs> so it was like, no, no. And we push it off. Oh, we'll get it next year. Oh, we'll get it. We'll get it next year. And we never quite nailed it. I mean, we had a, we had a full, outline ready to go and uh and we were we'd started to write it and we realized this isn't going to work so uh you know and we we were good about pulling the plug when we had to uh so that's why once again i'm still like i'm gonna do a time travel show i, I know how to make a time travel show that's fun and and realistic enough and has a has a bunch of heart and it's not sappy you know it's like it's finding that tone so we never, we never cracked it, but we tried every single season from two to eight to, uh, to make it work. Oh man. Maybe, maybe you can take your two must do ideas and, and combine them. Maybe the time machine is in the amusement park. There we uh, go. Uh, there we go. There we go. There we go. <laughs> then we done just, and done. We can just do it together. Um, <laughs> um, two last things for you. So, uh, you kind of alluded to it earlier, but your email line is phenomenal. It's, you know, Steve Frank's psych the movie three of six or, or what have you. Um, I started that my, with the first movie I wrote one of six. So great. <laughs> so all these executives who don't know who I am and they send me something and I send something back and I'm sure they're like, well, that's pretty presumptuous. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're but just I, putting I, it in the I, atmosphere. I, Listen, Brad, I think you do a lot of it, too, is you talk something into existence. You believe it and you keep pushing and you, and you don't let up until uh, until, you know, somebody wants to uh, to do the, uh, the, you know, to do whatever your project is. So, you know, and by the way, I, I've, I've persevered on a lot of things that didn't didn't go. But with this, it's so far, it's uh, knock on wood. We're uh, we're doing all right. And, so uh, so we're looking it, it's looking uh, uh, good for another psych film, you would say? Like it's, it's uh, not, it's, we're optimistic. We're we've done good. really well. Uh, and we moved to the Peacock um, and we've done well there and the library does really well there. So it's all about, you know, the, this whole Netflix thing that happened last week is Netflix needs the, you know, franchises. And, uh, and I'm, I, I, I wince a little bit when I say that psych would be a franchise, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we are in a, in a, in a, in our, in our own silly way. Uh, and, you know, that's the kind of thing that drive people back and, you know, and and to have something that makes people go back and watch the shows. The movies are so um, reflective of what happens on the show. There's so many hidden things that you'll find going back to the episodes and, and all that. And so um, four, uh, I'm, I feel pretty confident with four. I, my email signature is four of six. If we get to five, I'm going to change it to five of nine just to uh, maybe I'll go five of eight, move it to five and nine. But I did that right from the pilot. I'm sure I told you this story, but I'll repeat it for, uh, and people can just turn me off now. If they, uh, <laughs> but on the pilot, I kept saying, oh, there's no way this doesn't go to series. And people are like, stop, you can't say that, I'll jinx it. And I go, no, no, it's going to series for sure. And we went to series like, ah, no way this doesn't go five seasons. And they're like, oh, stop that. And that, that's the voice I used, yeah, this voice. Uh, and so pretty soon I had to go, okay, I had to change it to six seasons, seven seasons. And then I went to eight. And I go, all right, we got to stop there. <laughs> <laughs> we're, pu we're pushing it too much. So yeah, with the movies, I'm like six, six movies. Let's do them. Let's do it. Uh, let's do it. I mean, it, it makes me happy just as, as a longtime psych fan. And if you ever need somebody who has hair that compete with James Roday to play a background yeah. uh, character, you know, you know where to find me. Uh, I, I, I know I'm, I'm making my way down to Houston now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, um, okay. Last question. You have the DeLorean time machine. You're getting in it. What date are we putting in? Are we going forward? Are we going back? Like, I know you have, you of all people have probably thought about this, you know, so you have the time machine. It's yours. Where are we going? 
I'm going back. I'm going back to the 1930s. Uh, I love the 1930s. Uh, it's a it's a cool time. I don't want to want to go back in time to like try to kill Hitler because you know I couldn't. I could never get to Hitler. Right. You know? How are you going to get it's to? Like, it? Yeah, You're exactly. six foot eight. It's They're like, going to see you coming from all yeah, the way. I, I tell someone else, "Hey, you should do. You should. <laughs> you should do it." But I'm not going. I'm not going to be the guy that pulls it off. And then the old West, I love the old West. I've kind of had these like inklings that I may have lived in the old West. If you, if I'm having weird dreams in the, in the middle of the night, but, but too dusty, too, you know, too much heat and, and space between towns. Yeah. Uh, too much dysentery in the middle ages and, and all, all that sort of stuff. So I think I, I think I'd go back to the thirties cause it seems like I have just enough modern stuff. And uh, worlds evolved a little bit, uh, uh-huh. but uh, you know it's not it's not the '40s. You're you're just in World War II. '50s is like its own sort of thing, and then the, the, the '60s could be fun. For first half of the '60s, I think would be fun. Uh, the Vietnam '60s not as fun. '70s, <laughs> I, I grew up in the '70s. I, we don't need to see those clothes ever again. <laughs> And then the, the 80s, I did it. I did it. You know, I, I have lucid memories of uh, of the 70s and 80s. Oh, that's great. So the 1930s, I, I actually really yeah. like that. That's a, that's a that's a good one. That's a real good one. Um, well, where I, would you go? Um, oh. you know, it's hard for me to say. I don't want to go forward. I don't want to know. Yeah. You know, I like the mystery of it. Like, let's just see what happens. But I like the idea of of the 30s, the 30s, 20s, maybe like right, you know, right post industrial revolution. Like, let's see where America is. At that point, uh-huh. I mean, I really like those ideas. I mean, I'd love to see some of the big metropolises like New York, what they were like, you know, yeah. right there. I mean, my grandparents were born in the 19 teens and 1920s. So to kind of get to see what the lives that they lived, um, you know, that'd be fun for me. You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Go to the World's Fair in Chicago. Yes. You know, turn of the century. Would be or go go to go see when Mr. Lincoln was unveiled. You know, yeah. at, at the fair with Walt Disney, shake the man's hand and and see where this uh, idea comes from a, a couple of years later for his his you know wonderful world. Right? Yeah, yeah, no, no. That I'm a uh, I'm uh, above all. I, I love the the old Walt Disney. Uh, um, I, I've read a lot of biographies of, of Disney and love that sort of. I love the, all the stuff that he was trying to do in the 60s before he died because i think he was he was on the verge of something extraordinary i think the world the world was only uh the, the world was only big enough for that many years of him so uh <laughs> yeah i know 100 percent right i mean this is a guy who was operating on a different level he really was than everybody else as far as creative thinking and, and creative solutions to problems uh i mean yeah. you read i read several books about disneyland the, the making of it and disney world and just the problems that he was able to solve was just <laughs> making these theme parks and uh, well, even opening day, how much of a, uh, how horrendous it went in a large part, you know, it's just a phenomenal person. Really. Interesting. Well, and he just, he consistently failed over and over and over again. And every time brought, um, picked himself back up and then rolled the dice again immediately with all this money. So, you know, he could have gone he's just endlessly going bankrupt and just, you know, putting it all on the line for a, you know, for a Snow White and uh, and then for Disneyland and then, you know, rolling into television when they're like, oh God, what are you doing with television? So I, it's it's a great story, of, you know, of, of just perseverance through to complete failures. Do you Which believe was, that? Do you believe that's his skull? His skull in the Pirates of the Caribbean ride? Is this something that you <laughs> you believe, or is he is he buried beneath the ride, as some people say? My buddy Tim, who is uh, um, who plays guitar on the theme song to uh, Psych. to to Psych, he uh, he worked at the park with me. Worked at he chose pirates instead of. Uh, of, of for, to be trained on and there was a register reporter there once and they was guys walking around looking for some story and uh, there was a there was a cold storage behind pirates of the caribbean and, and tim, tim inadvertently confirmed it that walt disney was was frozen there <laughs> And, and it made it into the paper and he got called up and uh and and man it hit the fan uh oh, that no. week but I would love it if if Disney was cryogenically frozen be uh, because why not? And I tell you, this is the funniest thing. I was late in my Disney career and we had to go back to the show buildings 
um, which is now where where Star Wars Galaxy's Edge is. There's so busy, and you you get to ride the golf carts back there, and it's it's awesome. Um, yeah, it's it's awesome for me. It's not really exciting for any other human being in the world. It'd be awesome it's, for it's me fun. too. So I go back there, and I go back. There, I had to go pick something up, but we we're doing we we're doing the guest control thing. And on a shelf, in a dusty old shelf, there's a book and there's 20 manuals from the 50s, and right in the middle of it was cryogenics, and I'm like. <laughs> No. <laughs> like this is either the discovery of a lifetime or somebody is funny as hell and it's been there for, since 1972 <laughs> but i, I love, love i love finding that book it made me so happy i love that too i love that and i love your indiana jones pinball machine and your incredible oh, yeah. incredible conversation um again steve it, 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 it's just such an honor to talk to you Psych is so near and dear to me as it is to millions of people out there who love the show it's my comfort food uh, for television, I think I've seen every episode a dozen or more times, probably more oh, than that. So uh, that's too many. It, no, it's not. It's not <laughs> enough. It's not enough. Uh, um, it's not enough. And uh, your, your favorite psych episode, I guess, is it? You know, every, all the cast seems to say late night Gus. Everybody seems to say late night Gus. I, to me, I like. I like. Well, I have to once again. I have to do categorize them. Sure. For my experience, for my experience, I love doing the musical. It was the greatest oh, dream of my lifetime. Yeah. Getting to write those songs and and do all that. For uh, other people's, I like to take myself out of it. Office space is, uh, to me, uh, the funniest one and 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 one of the most enjoyable. I really like doing the uh, the 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 London episode. Um, that was really fun too, uh, just to get a chance to be there with Vinny Jones and yeah. and Carrie Ellis, and you know that's uh, there's just so many. I, I I you know we love what we are doing. It was so fun to do that uh, that it could change. It could change on any given day, but uh, but uh, I think the, the musical for me is my is my favorite. Um, and if if I'm honest, like the most fun I've ever had was doing Psych the Movie Three. Um, you know, just because that the the birth scene at the end of that movie was was two it's days so of, funny, of the hardest laughing I've ever done in my life. Like, and, and we were all had to be masked up because of of pandemic protocol. Like, my glasses were just because of what everybody was doing in that in that sequence that if, if you're listening to this show and you haven't seen psych 3 the birth scene is one of the funniest things in all of psych history like all of psych history it's one of the funniest things I, i've ever seen so rush out and go and stream them all on peacock so we can get four five six seven eight nine as many psych films as we can get start the franchise all over again and yeah, Steve, I'm yeah. confident. I'm confident we're getting to the next one. So, uh, and then, and, and we can find other ways to deliver it as well. All right. So. So, it sounds good to me. This is Steve Franks on back to the future, the podcast, Steve. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks so much, Brad. So there he was, Mr. Steve Franks, just a Phenomenal, phenomenal guest on Back to the Future the podcast. The perfect guest, in my estimation, to be on this show. Want to give a big shout out to him and make sure you go support all the psych films that are on Peacock, the streaming service from NBC. We have a great show next week. Allison Robicelli, the person who wrote the cookbook for Hill Valley, will be joining us on Back to the Future the podcast. Until then. I'm your friend in time, Brad Gilmore. This is the only podcast looking back in time's greatest film trilogy of all time, Back to the Future. I'll see you in the future. Oh, Brad, what have you done now?